No Chris Paul, no Devin Booker, and the Phoenix Suns keep delivering thrillers. We'll talk about the latest, a loss to the Milwaukee Bucks on the road on ABC, coming up on today's episode of Locked on Suns. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a contributor at suns.com, as well as Dime Magazine, and a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past five seasons. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen each and every day. We are free. We are everywhere from YouTube to your favorite podcast platform. And the best way to keep us free is to do exactly what you are already doing. Listening, watching, subscribing, following, all of that good stuff. Tell every Suns fan in your life to do the same. We'll keep growing like we have throughout the past season, which has been a thriller. Let's dive in, guys. 132-122 loss to the Milwaukee Bucks. And a disappointing game. I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to cut corners here. It's obvious. You know, you want to beat this team. The Suns want to beat this team. They did it once already. They blew them out at home. And now Milwaukee gets one back on them. So we'll start with how the Suns were able to keep it close with their backup squad, their B team. Basically, no Devin Booker and no Chris Paul. First, though, guys, today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, which has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. So that's exactly where I think you got to start here. My big takeaway from this game, and there's a lot. There really a lot happened. <laughs> that sounds uh, very basic, but it's the truth. Um, so we'll get to all of it. But first and foremost, you have a team without its two star players. It's it, especially its two star offensive players scoring 122 points, keeping pace with the reigning, you know, not reigning, but two-time MVP, a 44-point performance from Chris Middleton, a 24-point performance from Drew Holiday, 26 points from the Bucks off the bench, and yet the Suns are right there with them until the final plays of the game. Um, the 10-point deficit <clears throat> does not tell the truth of what happened in this one um, at all. You saw really the Suns were, it was a one possession game. And then Milwaukee was able to get a few late once it was basically out of reach. So this was not a 10 point win. This was neck and neck and the Suns stuck it out. Um, That's been a trend all year, which is what I, where I kind of want to hit just from a statistical standpoint off the bat last season, the Suns were plus 4.4 per 100 possessions in the minutes where neither Booker or Paul were out there. This year, they are up to 6.4 plus 6.4 per 100 possessions when neither guy is out there. So they have improved in those minutes pretty pretty dramatically. And we saw more of that tonight. You had 30 points from DeAndre Ayton. You had 23 from Campaign. You had a sorely needed Landry Shamit, who we will definitely be getting to. And then you had 19 and 14 from Crowder and Bridges, respectively. Perhaps most important, most impressive, I guess, within all of that, though, is the assists. The fact that every player in the starting lineup outside of DeAndre Ayton had at least five assists, including Crowder and Bridges with seven and six. Um, Just uh, honestly incredible to see that they are, are able to put this type of thing together. So, look, they are so much better suited, I think, and you'll probably see this when Devin Booker gets back. I think he will take Shamit's place in the starting lineup. I don't think we will see the point book thing again. I think this was the plan all along was to start Payne, and he just took a little bit longer than expected to return. I've said that several times. And you just see how different things are with Payne out there. Um, it's Seeing the way that he was able to puncture this defense tonight, it felt, this afternoon I guess, it felt like a it made me reconsider and wonder why he was so ineffective against the bucks in the first round uh, in the first go round in the finals of course like 
even when Drew Holiday in this game was pressuring him three-quarter court, full court, his speed was a real problem for the Bucs. He was able to get past Drew Holiday. He was able to give up the ball and, and keep moving and get it back and attack a rotating defense. Payne was a real threat offensively as a scorer and a playmaker and, and really setting everybody else up. But you also saw in, in all sorts of moments in the game, not just um, you know, when it was early and, and loose bridges getting to his mid range pull up jumper and really turning that into a, a threat, moving decisively, getting to his spots and making those shots. Crowder continues to be, I think, I don't know what the stats say. I know his three ball has been coming around of late, but, but generally a little bit lower but this, to me, feels like it has to be one of the best seasons of Jay Crowder's career. I mean, I'm sure there were some seasons early on where he was really athletic and, um, you know, physically more at a, at a higher level now than or then than he might be now. I'm sure those Boston years and whatnot, but he has put it together. So from top to bottom, you really saw a lot of things come together. I also feel like you have to just give uh, credit to the Suns coaching staff for the type of, of game plan that they were able to put together, especially against Giannis, the double big stuff that we've seen really work for them against the Bucks in that first game. They, they transferred it over. You saw Aiton and Biombo. You saw Biombo and, and McGee with Torrey Craig at the three. Like the Suns have learned their lesson. No Brook Lopez tonight still, but the Suns learned their lesson last year in the playoffs and were able to come away realizing, look, we need to play bigger. We need to play bigger. You saw Monty dust off Bismack Biombo, who hasn't been playing much, and uh, the the size was a an obvious concerted effort tonight. So, all of that, it's just another example, another game where we're just seeing this team figure it out, put put the pieces together. It seems like it's a different puzzle that they are finding together every single game. It feels like different players are are really being the standout night to night. But um, I know this sounds positive in a 10 point loss, but look, this is a team that just beat the Suns four straight times heading into this season in the NBA finals to win a championship. And both sides were mostly healthy. So for this team, as they've been doing all year to figure it out, learn, improve while their two stars are out, I I do think you have to come away feeling pretty encouraged, even if late in the game, some things did not go right. And that's where we'll hit next here. The Suns did not get the they didn't get what they needed from the referees. They didn't get the calls that they felt like they should have, that that a lot of fans watching seem to agree that they should have gotten. Um, you have not only the free throw disparity, which was 11 to 29 for Milwaukee. You have a, a call late where Jay Crowder gets called for a foul when it, it, it appeared that it was a, an offensive foul by Chris Middleton. To me, pretty... Pretty decisively, he extended his arm and, 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 you know, created the contact, initiated the contact that led to um, the ball going out of bounds. And then Jay Crowder getting called for that turnover. Like to me, that either could have been a no call and you just punish the offensive player for for making a non-basketball move and the ball is a turnover, the ball's out of bounds, or it's an offensive foul, probably more fairly. So, you know, small and big ways that that impacted this game. I mean, if not for G- for Giannis fouling out and, and struggling with fouls throughout the second half when he had four of his fouls, um, you probably would have been hearing about that being the narrative of this game even more so than it, ended up, than it ended up being. You also had Giannis missing some free throws in that fourth quarter as well himself to not quite make the Suns pay for the fouls as much as they may have otherwise. So, it, I, I don't think it's the only reason that the Suns lost. You also had some turnovers late, a couple that did not go, uh, that obviously did not help the Suns' cause, but it, it was an impressive effort, a continuation of the Suns executing without their best players, but because of that late game screw-ups, the referees not doing them any favors, you get that 10-point loss. So I don't feel like the sky is falling by any means. Yes, you would have loved to come out with the win when you were so close to it, but I don't also feel like uh, there's much to be worried about in the grand scheme of things. That's how some games go. There's not always a big narrative 
coming out of whatever happens. But plenty more to discuss here, including DeAndre Ayton. That is where we will go next, guys. But first, today's show brought to you by Built Bar. I am honestly on the hunt, in the in need to, to place another order because I, like probably many of you, burn through protein bars and protein products like crazy. It's the perfect snack when you wake up and you're needing something to get your day started. If you're going to be active, it's perfect after a workout or some exercise. And it's a nice snack just to make sure you're getting what you need in your body. And the great, great thing about Bilt Bar is you know what you're getting each and every time. No more than 150 calories, no more than five grams of sugar, but packed with 15 to 20 grams of protein, delicious flavors like strawberry or double chocolate, and the first of their kind, Bilt Bar Puffs as well, adding to the options for you. The first ever protein infused marshmallow, meaning they're softer, easier to chew, more delicious than the classic Bilt Bar, and packed with incredible flavor. Cinnamon churro, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, or my personal favorite, lemon cheesecake. At Bilt Bar, they are all about taste. They make it delicious first, then figure out how to make it healthy. So you know, not only are you getting something good for your body, but you're getting something delicious as well. Go to built.com guys, place an order, replenish your stock and use the promo code LOCK15 when you do to get 15% off your next order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. Tried to watch back a little bit DeAndre Ayton's 30 point night tonight to see what was going well, what was going poorly. Um, What did he do on Giannis? I actually feel like we'll start with the positive. We'll we'll end with the negative. So the second half, things really flipped for the front court matchups in general because you could see the Suns taking it to, giving it to, feeding it to DeAndre. Ayton. He was 14 of 19 from the field. He was clearly a part of the game plan heading into the second half. I think if you ever, if we do see a bona fide finals rematch, like a real, it's in the NBA finals again type of rematch between these two teams, the the Bucs will quickly figure out that they cannot survive defending DeAndre Ayton with Bobby Portis. We'll see if this Serge Ibaka thing is a a weapon for the Suns against, for the Bucs against DeAndre Ayton. But in this game, nobody could do much of anything. You didn't even really see the Suns all that scared against Giannis in in terms of like post scoring. You saw JaVale McGee take it at him a couple of times. You saw DeAndre able at least, you know, comfortable taking those shots. And then really um, I, I what, what made a big difference was Giannis getting into foul trouble. As I mentioned, he had four fouls in the second half alone. He was not on the floor for a good chunk of the fourth quarter. He hit that third foul in the uh, third quarter. So that was able. That was a big part of why Aiton was able to get into rhythm a little bit. The size on the floor for the Bucks just wasn't the same, and and he's always going to have an advantage, especially with Lopez uh, hurt right now. So that's the good. I would say that the negative was I don't feel like you know for the most part, Giannis. Giannis was and this is across both games, but it was it was true again tonight. The Suns' best defense against Giannis has come in those double big lineups. Now we'll see in a real series if it happens, whether the Suns can score enough with those double big lineups to, to balance things out, but that's been their best way to stop Giannis. When it was just Aiton, it was more of the same. Um, not so much getting to the line in that first half, but Giannis had 17 of his 19 points in the, in the first half. A lot of that was just, running in transition, cutting, rolling to the basket with Aiton playing center against him. And Giannis wasn't phased really for the most part. So that's part of the bad. The other part of the bad is the the rebounding. I honestly, uh, I probably should have brought this up sooner, but I wanted to start on a little bit of a positive note because I do think my general vibe off of this game is, is mostly positive. But this is is awful. I mean, the Suns almost got doubled up in the rebounding column in this game. 48 for the Bucks, 27 for the Suns. And that's with some of those double big lineups. That's with, you know, Bismack, Biombo, and JaVale McGee getting a 22 minutes combined off the bench and Aiton playing 33. Um, just not good enough. You you cannot allow this Bucks team to get 14 
second chance point or uh, second chances with offensive rebounds. They had, let's see how many second chance points they had. Um, oh man, I always forget that this this box score. The one thing it doesn't have on my ESPN advanced stats Google Chrome attachment is second chance points. But they had 46 points in the paint and. Those 14 offensive rebounds speak for themselves. Where I was coming in with Aiton is that he himself only had eight rebounds. Um, 30, and this is a continue. I don't know what it's been since the All Star break. He's had some scoring nights. He has had some, you know, performances that you feel pretty good about. But it's now the Knicks and the Bucks, two very big teams who play very physically, who have just handled him in, in, in the rebounding category, like box him out made him a non-factor in that regard. And I'm not going to put all the blame on Aiton, but when the Suns are going to play a seven-footer in their starting lineup and then no one else bigger than six seven, like it's pretty clear who's supposed to be doing the rebounding. And we have evidence from last year's playoffs that that is a pretty good pathway toward rebounding well, is putting DeAndre Aiton out there and saying, go to work. And it, it, it just hasn't been effective in two straight games now. And the Suns were very close to losing both. So it's just not acceptable. He took full ownership of that, acknowledged it himself post game. It's not something that I'm, you know, unveiling here as an exclusive on lockdown Suns. It's very clear, but when you look and it's 13 for, for Giannis, eight for Chris Middleton, six for Portis, 10 for Ibaka, even five for somebody like Jordan Wara, like this needs to be better. Um, but also, I, you know, of course, have to point out Mikhail Bridges, zero rebounds. JaVale McGee in nine minutes, one rebound. Bismack Biombo in 13 minutes, three rebounds. Like, it's far from one person's fault here. But we kind of saw both poles of DeAndre Ayton. We saw the good and the bad. And on the offensive end, though, I, you know, one one more thing to kind of bring it back to the positive here before we move on to the bench mob and, and everything else is... Uh, he is diversifying his offensive game slowly, but surely, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, he was very quick with his floater and his hook shot and everything else tonight. You really did see a certain level of aggressiveness. There were some people I saw online who wanted to, uh, you know, put this out there that it happened because it was his son's first birthday. I don't know. Sure. If that's the explanation, then great. I don't, I don't know what it was, but you did see that decisiveness, that quick decision-making, that aggressiveness from Aiton, and it makes a world of difference because when he has that height advantage, it really is just a matter of, of mindset at that point because he has the skill and he has the, again, the physical advantages. So it's it's just making it happen at a certain point. And tonight he did, and I think he can going forward. And if you see games, I mean, I guess I don't need to say if. We have seen games where Aiton does both of those things, where he is aggressive looking to score, where he's playing with good energy and decisiveness, and he's being being physical on the defensive end when it comes to protecting the rim, defending his man, Giannis in this case, and rebounding. And he he needs to check every single one of those boxes for the Suns to make a deep playoff run. They did it once because, in large part, he was that guy. And when he's that guy, they look incredible. And that's just always going to be true. So tonight, he checked only a, a handful of those boxes. He didn't check the stop Giannis in isolation or, you know, one-on-one and he didn't check the rebounding box. He checked the scoring box and he checked the energy box and, and that's it. And look, the sun's lost, you know, so not to rain on his parade or, or make this about him, but look, he also took ownership for it. So I don't feel like I'm out of line to put some blame on him, but 30 points was a season high. He, he, he is a big part of the reason the Suns were there. He's also a big part of why they lost. So thus is life without your star players. All right, let's close out the show. Bench Mob Vibe Check and returning to an old, a recently unveiled recap segment that I forgot about and, and recently remembered. So we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. First, though, guys, today's show also brought to you by betonline.net. Football, of course, in the rearview mirror here, but basketball is heating up in both both the pro and college side. You got the conference tournaments going on. We're not too far from the NBA playoffs. So from all the latest odds, totals, and player performance props to where the next fired coach might land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for not only scores and 
odds and bets, but of course, podcasts and news as well. Bet online and getting into the content game now too. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, the UFC, and even your favorite Vegas casino game. So head to the website today or use their mobile app to learn more about the trends and action and get in on it. Bet online where the game starts. Two recap segments to hit today. Bench mob vibe check. Now we'll start there. The person that's going to get the most love and attention today is actually not on the bench in this particular game, but he normally is. And if he can play at the level that we did see him play at today, I think you got to feel pretty good about it. And that's Landry Shamit. He played 34 minutes starting in place of Devin Booker. His, I want to say, well, he's been back since the break, but this is his second game, third game in the starting lineup with Booker out and by far his best one. One of his better games in the season, I would say. And all it comes down to is similar to what we were just talking about with Aiton is mindset. Monty has stressed repeatedly that he doesn't want hesitation or really much thought at all put into anything for Landry. It's just take the shots when they're there. And I thought he did a good job of that tonight, but I also feel like the Suns did a great job scheming him open. He was on a lot of his pin downs and dribble handoff action and stuff like that, that we see Booker, Cam Johnson do often. Shamit was getting a lot of those today with both of those players out. Uh, he was wide open. So, you know, his footwork and decision-making off the ball is, is really, really good. He, he comes out with a ton of open space around him much of the time. So that's not the problem. Problem is, is taking those shots, making them, and also knowing the right decision if not, right? And so tonight, I think the best thing that you can say about his game isn't that he went three of six from deep. It's that he looked completely comfortable in that point five. Um, talked about the fact that everybody outside of Aiton in that starting lineup had five plus assists. That includes Shannon. He had five and zero turnovers. He was he was getting downhill off of those handoffs and pin downs and stuff and actually getting lobs up for Aiton, for McGee, et cetera. Like those are Booker types of moves. Like you can tell that he is really embracing that two guard spot in this offense, that Booker mold as a player and, and realizing and embracing the fact that he's going to have great opportunities off coming off the ball and getting, you know, getting it in momentum in motion to either score or create for a teammate and in easy situations, relatively speaking, like, you know, come off of a screen run toward the center, catch the handoff at the top of the key, come downhill. Basically that turns into a pick and roll. The big man rolls. You can either take the three right off the, the catch. You can take a couple dribbles into a mid range. You can drive for a layup or you can drive for the lob or you can drive for the kick out. Like it's, it's really that simple once the opening has already been created by the set and he's just learning that. And I think tonight he, he really took advantage of it in, in full force. Another inefficient night from Torrey Craig. He continues to shoot the ball extremely poorly. This is what a lot of people were worried about when he was acquired last year. Instead, he was on fire completely for the entire time he was a son. After the trade this year, it's been the opposite. So you feel it out. You wait. His defense is still there. He still understands where to be on this team and everything else, but the, the the shots continue not to fall. That's kind of all that I want to hit on the bench mob vibe check. Aaron Holiday was solid. Um, saw a couple people saying he should have been out there more. I don't know. I, I think pain pain and Holiday together is an interesting concept. I just think this team, the Bucks, you want to play big, so you don't necessarily want to go to that lineup. It's it's not easy, but I think Holiday has earned you know everything that he's getting. The last thing here, the recurring segment that I forgot about and, and just remembered is, okay, I admit it, the Suns just can't guard that guy, I think is what I called it. And it's actually going, the crown is being placed on two players' heads tonight. One of them is Drew Holiday. One of them is Chris Middleton. The Suns can't seem to do anything about these guys. They combine to go 23 of 40 from the field, 9 of 14 from deep, 13 of 13 from the line, 14 assists, 10 rebounds, 5 steals, and 68 points. Those two guys are the reason the, Sun, the the Suns lost this game. Not 
Giannis. Those two guys are the reason. They Something about playing the Suns gives them a pep in their step. They feel like the best players on the planet when they're suited up against the Suns. I don't really know how to explain it, honestly, uh, at all. Um, <laughs> like I... I, 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 the, the, my analysis ends there. Like, that's why I said, okay, I admit it. The Suns just can't guard these guys. Like I don't Middleton. Yes. Like late in the finals, it felt like Booker was the best option against him. So, okay. So be it. Booker wasn't active tonight. So maybe things are a little better because I think Booker strength wise is a, a pretty solid bet to do that. Now I think Crowder is also in that type of mold, but he's giving up I actually think Booker is taller than Jay Crowder. I don't know if that, that might not be true at all, but it feels that way. Feels like Middleton can shoot over the top of Crowder in a way that he can't Booker. Maybe it's just their wingspan. I'm not sure. And then holiday, like the guy just is suddenly out there like Steph Curry when he plays the Suns. like these step back threes that you can't guard. He just has the confidence to launch them at, at will. Apparently only when he plays the Suns. I know he's been a great three point shooter since he got to Milwaukee. Like, don't get me wrong, but for some reason, it feels like he's taking shots that he never takes against any other team just because it's the Suns. And they don't have a great option for that either. So I would think if this is the finals rematch, that I think these are still two, the two best teams in each conference. I know there's Miami now. I know there is Brooklyn and Philly. I, I, I don't have a, a great grasp on where the East will go. So I don't know if that's the case, but I think it would be Booker on Middleton and Bridges on Holiday and then Crowder on Giannis, whatever, but it's uh, it's not great when you keep having these guys go off the way that they have. So uh, we'll see. The last thing here, I guess, would be the Serge Ibaka point. I, I don't feel like I had a great grasp of if he's going to be a difference maker. You know, it'll be a lot dependent to me is just on what happens with Brick Lopez because I think that'll affect how the Bucks play, their rotation, the size and how much the Suns need to play that size, all of it. So it's hard for me to necessarily say Ibaka had a double double, but I, I don't really feel like he was a massive force in this game necessarily. And I think the Suns have enough big man depth to, to match him. So we'll see. Great game, though. We'll be headed toward a back to back on Tuesday and Wednesday. So we have one little pit stop tomorrow to catch up. Those couple of games and then Aaron Edwards to close out the week. That's the rundown for another week of Suns basketball, guys. Thanks for making Locked On Suns your first listen today and every day. Now go make Locked On NBA your second listen to catch up on everything you missed around the association this weekend.